Welcome to What's New with AWS. I'm Jeff Barr. Before we dive in, I want to thank you for your continued feedback. Really love all the comments that you leave, so keep it coming. Today, I've got another story for you and three great launches. Okay, so for my story, I want you to remember 2703. When I was young and just getting started in my career, I was really just always ready to just jump in and build something. I had a lot of confidence in tech, probably not a lot of confidence in any other part of my life, but with tech, I could just jump in, I could make stuff happen. I was just turning 21. I was going to community college part-time because I didn't have a whole lot of money. I went to a local launch event for the, the then brand new IBM PC. When I was there, I met this guy, Dave Deichel. We were both actually like peering into the machine at the same time, kind of looking at the bus, looking at the chips. And Dave just said, introduced himself and he said, what do you think? And I said, well, you know, they, they chose that Intel 88 chip, but you know, I, I actually think that the Motorola 68000 is just a whole lot better. His ears kind of perked up and he said, wow, that's kind of cool. My company's building a computer around that chip, so you should come and talk to us. I did that. It was this little startup called Intellimac. I got to meet Dave and I met Dick, who was the CEO. And Dick told me this really interesting promise that they'd made. They had this operating system called ROS. And the only amazing thing about ROS was that it ran this compiler for this brand new language called ADA. Dick had promised their customers that he could deliver them a four user system that would run this ADA compiler so that they could get a great economy of scale, four users, one computer. And he just said, well, Jeff, we need to build one of these. Could you actually make it happen? And being young and eager to jump in and do things, I said, I'm pretty sure I could figure out how to do that. Not quite sure exactly how, but Dick said, well, I'll pay you $10 an hour. I'd been making only seven at my old job, so it seemed like a, a great opportunity. I gave my two weeks notice. I bought this book about 68,000 programming. I started to study it and I got to understand that I could actually make this happen. Back at school, I was using this operating system called VM370 from IBM. This was a really cool thing for its time because what it did, it was a virtual operating system and it ran other operating systems as guests. From what I can figure out, IBM probably spent years building this. They put millions of dollars, maybe hundreds of, of developers into it. But thinking about what it did and for what Dick asked me to do, I'm thinking, well, I can probably do the same thing on this 68,000 based machine. No one really said it was impossible, so I'm just gonna jump in and make it happen. So it's the first day on the job, and I'm told I've got three months to actually get this multi-user OS up and running and ready for delivery. Seems pretty reasonable. But then I find out they've never actually made it run even single user mode. They've got the generic OS from the manufacturer, but they've never customized it to run on their hardware. It literally doesn't even boot. I don't care, I'm gonna make this work. I write the bootstrap code, I learn how to assemble my code and burn it onto EEPROMs, I write the drivers for the, the disk and for the serial devices. This was actually a huge detour from what I thought I was gonna be doing, but it turned out to be an incredibly valuable detour. It taught me all I need to know about that machine, literally from the bare metal on up. The memory layout, every bit of input and output devices, the bit patterns, of the, the instructions and of the, the various registers on the processor. I knew it from the ground on up. It took me about six weeks to get to the point where this OS was up and running and the devs at the company were actually able to write and compile and run their ADA code. Everything's actually looking pretty good. So we're about halfway through my, my, uh, my allotted three months at this point. A customer comes on by. His name is Ed Burrard. If you know your history of object-oriented programming, Ed was one of the, the first people to endorse object programming and to go out and train people. So Ed comes in and he's bought one of these multi-user systems and he just kind of casually says, well, this is gonna, going to work, right? I actually mortgaged my house in order to buy one. So the stakes have been raised just a little bit. I'm thinking, okay, Ed, his house, I've, I've got to really make this happen. So I've got a couple of weeks still to go. I'm ready to take the next big step. I take that single user OS and what I think I'm gonna do, I'm simply going to slice the memory four ways. 
I'm going to implement four user multitasking. I'm just going to run four copies of the operating system. Actually seems pretty simple. I'd partition out the memory. I remember this very, very elegant piece of code that, that had three nested loops that set up all of the memory management. I used every data register and every address register of that 68,000 to make it happen. I've got the memory all set up. Now I simply need to apportion the time across those four operating systems. Actually not too difficult, at least, at least to me anyway. So I, I set up this, this clock interrupt. Every time an interrupt comes in, I take the running OS, I save away all of its registers, I pick the next one that's about to run, I restore all of its registers, and I turn control over to that new OS. I added a little bit of interrupt logic to the drivers so that the drivers wouldn't step on each other, but it kind of seemed pretty clean and pretty straightforward. At the hardware level, I had no debugger to fall into, I had no in-circuit emulator, there was no runtime, so I had simply had to make all of this work exactly right. So I, I was very, very careful and just got everything to the point where I was very confident that I was doing things in, in the right way. Get time to start testing it out. I started up and I had done things right and it would actually run for 20 to 30 minutes at a time. Each of these different operating system partitions had a separate copy of the OS. You could log in from a serial terminal. You could do all the usual OS commands and you could write code and compile it and run it, each fully independent of the other three. So that would work for almost a half an hour sometimes, but then unfailingly, one of these OS partitions would just crash, but it would always crash in a weird and totally irreproducible way. So I'm looking at the code and can't really figure out what's going wrong because there's really not that many options. Every time we go through the code, it's going through the same code, I'm saving the state, I'm restoring the state. If I'm not doing that exactly right, it's gonna fall apart long before 30 minutes. So I'm, I'm measuring and counting and I'm realizing I'm doing the right thing millions upon millions of times. At this point within the company, there are no other system developers. So I'm really on my own. There's one person building the hardware, there's me doing system software, and there's a whole bunch of developers writing really high level, super abstract ADA code. It's so it's just me and that machine and my code. So put yourself in my shoes. Like, what would you do to get this figured out? So I'm, I'm trying lots and lots of different things and the, the deadline's approaching. The hardware guy, he says, well, the hardware's getting ready to ship. We're, we're almost there. The company's really getting anxious. I can see that Dick and Dave are checking in a couple times a day. I'm seeing all these ADA programmers just kind of walking back and forth past my office, kind of peering in like, how's that kid doing? Is he gonna, is he gonna succeed or do we lose our jobs? And then I think about Ed and Ed and his training business and the fact that he's mortgaged his house. I gotta make this thing work. Out of desperation, I said, I'm just gonna just think and think and think until I get this part figured out. Sometimes actually being on the computer turns out to be counterproductive and just being away from it is actually helpful, I've, I've found. I spent an entire night walking through Bethesda, Maryland. I'm just, I've, at this point, I've stared at the code so many times, it's just imprinted on my brain. Uh, it's actually still there. I can, I can still see this code to this very, very day. And this was 1981, 82. I'm wandering through the streets. I'm just stepping through the code line by line in my head. I'm thinking of every different possible way it could be wrong. And I can't, th I, I think of a bunch of different things I could have done wrong. And I disprove each of those in turn until there's really only one thing left. I'm thinking I'm saving in the registers. I'm putting them back. Those are really clear. Everything's set. I'm managing all the state. The drivers aren't getting in the way of each other. It, it really has to be memory corruption. There, there's no other possibility here. I've, I've eliminated every other possibility. Step through that code in my head and think and think and think. Somewhere around three or four in the morning, I find a diner and I have breakfast. And I'm, I've convinced myself, it's just absolutely for sure, it is memory corruption. So I get this idea. I say, well, I'm gonna take the operating system image that I usually load. I'm gonna put a really simple test program in here. I'm simply going to fill up memory with a pattern, and then I'm going to check for that pattern, make sure it's all there. If this runs forever, then my theory is wrong and it's not memory corruption. But if I detect some changed memory, then there it is. I figured it out. Wait a couple hours until the, the office is, is open. Really easy to code up this little program. 
really excited about this. I, I run it, wait a little bit, 10, 15 minutes on end, it crashes. And I was super happy that it crashed because that actually meant I was onto something. It was the simplest of programs ever. I simply filled up the entire memory range with the known value. And then I kept checking again and again and again, just make sure that same value was there. That was the case for a, a few minutes, but when it crashed, it crashed. And now remember that number I told you before, 2703. Well, unless you know Motorola 68,000, that, that's just a number to you. But to me, that was a really important number. And because I'd done that dive deep earlier on in the hardware, I knew exactly what that was. That was the processor status flags and the interrupt mask. When I saw that, it was so obvious how I'd messed up. As I'm switching from partition to partition, there was one instruction. There was one instruction that created a little critical section where if we got an interrupt at that exact point, it was gonna corrupt memory. I saw that 2703, I knew what it was, and I knew how to fix it really within seconds. I added one or two statements into my code, assembled it, burned it in, started the testing. 10 minutes go by, we're good. 20, 30, still on the outer edge of when it usually crashed, we're looking good. An hour goes by, we're actually up and running. This thing actually works. Finished a couple of little fine tunings, we shipped. Ed Burrard went on to train thousands and thousands of developers using these machines and object-oriented programming. Company shipped a bunch of these machines. Actually made it all happen. So what did I learn from all this? I, I learned that if you're doing tech and if you're not a brain surgeon or a pilot, it's actually okay to jump in with both feet and, and figure things out as you go. However, it's so important that you actually know the ins and outs of what you're working with. When you do that, the dive deep, when you know, here's how the machine starts, here's how the memory is laid out, here's what every register looks like, here's what every instruction does, here's every side effect. Knowing all that is just so important. In the face of all this pressure, I managed to really stay calm, stay focused on the outcome. And I kept, I persevered. I pushed this rock uphill. I went and I focused on that goal and I worked really hard to get there and to make it happen. Thanks so much for listening. All right, so let me tell you about some launches today. First cool one is a new awesome thing called CloudFront Functions. This one lets you do compute at the edge. You can run code in over 225 CloudFront Edge locations. Those are spread across 90 cities in 47 countries. This is really, really cool you get to run JavaScript functions at scale with really, really low latency. You can do things like manipulate HTTP headers. You can rewrite or redirect URLs. You can do cache key normalization. You can do access control via user-generated tokens. This is a really awesome feature, and I think you're going to get to really exercise your imagination here. You can get to this through the console and the IDE or through the command line and with an API. You first test and then deploy your functions. They're super easy to write. We've got some great examples for you on GitHub. You can learn more about this by reading Danilo's blog post. Our next launch focuses on Nitro Enclaves. This is a really cool feature. I think I blogged about it a year or so ago for the first time. The idea is you can create an isolated compute environment on a parent EC2 instance. I kind of think of it as a, a bubble universe. Within the Enclave, you get to create more isolation within the CPU and the memory. The isolation is from other users, apps, and libraries on the instance. It's a really powerful way for you to process confidential data. Within that enclave or that bubble universe, there's no external network connectivity, there's no persistent storage, and there's no user access. All the data flows in and out of the enclave over a local virtual socket. There's a, a really highly reduced attack surface, and it's also provably secure. So that's what Nitro enclaves are all about, and I've got two pieces of news. The first is you now create them on instances that are running Windows, and you can also run them in the US GovCloud regions. To learn more, you can read my original blog post or the What's New. Finally, I've got another new book for you. This one is called AWS Certified Security Specialty Exam Guide. This book is to help you become an AWS Certified Security Specialist. It's got over 500 pages of great info. Just some of the topics, the AWS Shared Responsibility Model, access management and policies, federated and mobile access, security EC2 instances, infrastructure and application security, incident response, logging, auditing, and governance, automated threat detection and remediation, key infrastructure, and believe it or not, even more. 
It's a great book. There's really helpful questions at the end of each chapter. That's all I've got for you this week. I really hope you enjoyed my story and the three launches. Love your comments and your questions on YouTube. Please keep them coming. Click through, like, subscribe, leave a comment. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon. Oh yeah, and don't forget, 2703. Always deep dive.